Good day to everyone. This is In Mind Channel with the best first hand information for startup founders and tech entrepreneurs. And today we have historical person as a guest in our podcast. Uh, please meet Dave Berkus, who is super angel with more than 200 of tech investments in his portfolio, the author of numerous books about startup development, creator of Berkonomics.com with weekly insights for tech entrepreneurs, and uh, of course, the president uh, and uh, the founder of Berkus Tech Ventures. Hello, Dave. Hello, Nelly. How are you? Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Thanks a lot for joining us today. And uh, we have so many questions from startup founders about uh, Dave Berkus himself and, of course, uh -huh. uh, his uh, well-known method of startup valuation. And I'm sure that a lot of people have asked you about that, but uh, how do you think uh, your method, Berkus method, is... Um, um, the only one uh, which uh, is uh, uh, applicable for early stage startups uh, or it works with the combination? Well, the first thing is there are many methods. And so we ought to talk about those first. But of the startup methods, that is the pre-revenue startup methods, there are really only three that make any uh, kind of a dent at all. And mine is one that was probably developed earliest of all. I developed it in 1996. And in 2001, a Harvard University professor wrote uh, the second book on angel investing. I have to say I wrote the first. Uh, the second book on angel investing. And of course, with his prestige, that book uh, became widely published. And uh, it previewed the lives of seven angel investors. And when he got to me, one of the seven, he mentioned the method I had been using that he had discussed with me. And he was the first to name it as the Burkus method. So I'm here to say that I didn't name my own method. <laughs> and that book became widely published and it uh, was the beginning of what turns out to be, if you look on Google now under the Berkus method, you'll find over 300,000 references to it. So- uh, uh, With our reference, it is even more. <laughs> yeah, 301,000, who knows? 300,000 and one. There are two other methods I do want to just mention before we start. My old friend, Bill Payne, uh, who has been involved in angel investing as long as I have, I started in 1993, uh, developed a scorecard, a scorecard method. And his method is about four times more difficult by the number of things you measure. And so it hasn't been used quite as much by as many people, but uh, it takes into account more elements. And I'll talk about the elements in a minute. And then uh, my good friend, John Houston, uh, who formed the Ohio Tech Angels, uh, developed a method that was using pluses and minuses, where if the total of the risks was greater than zero, then you had to watch out. And less than zero, you had a better chance of investing. So all of us are reducing risk with the methods we use. My method was developed to try and be the simplest possible way to find a valuation that made some sense. And that was uh, in 1996. In 2016, 20 years later, I updated the method because it was obvious to me that there were many more ways of using it. So I'm going to talk to you today about the updated method as I kind of build upon what it is. Okay? Yeah, definitely. It would be more relevant. It would, <laughs> as we now know. But when I first developed it, I had four elements of risk that I wanted to de-risk to make sure, since I never believed the financial projections, <laughs> I always wanted to find other elements that I thought were important. And so the first was the company's uh, idea itself. Did I believe that idea would fly in the environment that we knew, in the competition that I saw, in all the things that I had? So that was only one fourth, but I combined them all into one. And it really was, does this make my heart beat faster? <laughs> and so I gave, at that time, a maximum of $500,000 of valuation to does my heart beat faster? Is this a great idea? And uh, often I would give almost all 500,000 or I would have not gone further with that particular valuation. Interesting thought. 
The second one is, let's try and figure out whether or not the management is capable of taking this company to and through break-even. And break-even is my proxy for stability. So if I think the management has to be replaced, meaning the first investors and the board get a little tired of the management's inability, and the founders who are always the management at the beginning are relegated to their primary roles, which began as either marketing or in more cases, tech, then I would give a lesser rating of the $500,000 maximum to that management because it would be less stable than a management that would get all the way to $500,000 or break even. So there's the second one. The third one is the risk of execution. And the risk of execution is really divided into two. Number one, is there a prototype? Is the product developed? Is there something that will tell me that this is not going to take forever in both money and time to be able to get this idea to the marketplace? And if I felt that this was just an idea and no further along, no prototype, no product, I would give a zero. And yet if they had something that they could show, that would be up to 500,000, okay? And the fourth would be market acceptance under that general title of marketability. And market acceptance would be, is there a customer who said that I've seen this prototype, I've seen your idea, I've seen your product, and I believe that if you're ready to sell it to me, I'm ready to buy. Or a supplier that says, I make the parts for this thing that you're making, and I am so much a fan that I will give you 90 day terms or something of the kind that makes that supplier part of the equation. Either way, I have market validation and I will give up to $500,000 for that. So those are the four. And you saw that they all are involved in de-risking. That's the important thing to remember. And then there's a fifth, and the fifth relates to whether or not there's revenue. But uh, often, most often, these companies are pre-revenue. Or if any revenue, it often comes from services, consulting services that the founders just employ to be able to keep their company alive. And I give no credit for that. So we added it up to $2 million. And in 1996, $2 million was worth about $5 million today. Think about that. So in 2016, it was obvious to me looking back, even though there were so many references to it and so many people worldwide that knew me because of it, it was missing a couple of things. Number one, during the time leading up to the year 2000, in Northern California, Silicon Valley, a $500,000 maximum for each making $2 million maximum for the company was laughable because they were offering $5 million to anybody with a napkin who had an idea and a pen. And so it was obvious to me that at different places geographically in the world, let alone different times, that maximum valuation has to be flexible. And so in 2016, I exercised the idea of a maximum of 500,000 and let each geographic area, uh, angel investor or person making this method, choose their own maximum. And it freed them for different kinds of businesses and different kinds of geographies. In the United States, we have many areas where there is not much money available and the $2 million still holds after all these years. But if you go to the East Coast or the West Coast of our country, you're going to find lots of competition for money and lots of competition for ideas. And so that 2 million is a rare maximum. I came across one yesterday with a $750,000 valuation and they thought that was great. Uh, I was surprised. I invested uh, three or four years ago in a company that was in a state that didn't have real uh, access to money. And they had a $1,500,000 valuation. And we sold that company two and a half years later for 7.6 times our money in two and a half years. Well, that's not bad. That's a 300 and some odd percent gain per year. And you just never know. And that's why the geographic difference has to be brought into the equation. Since 1996, lots of companies in the medical technology and the biotechnology space have come to the angel environment for their initial funding. And there's no way that the kind of market test that I made would be relevant to them. They are much more inclined to look at 
uh, FDA approval. That's the name we use in our country, the Federal Drug Administration. And if they begin their approval in stage one, that's great. That's worth the full 500,000 or a million or whatever it is we give her as maximum. So we replace the marketability with that one. So you begin to see that people can replace any one of the four, maybe even two of the four tests, as they think it's relevant to their particular occasion and industry. And that's the Burkus method in a clamshell. <laughs> well, Burkus method is something like uh, people's method, where different stakeholders in different communities and countries can uh, replicate it, uh, substituting some parts of it, like model or box, like uh, Lego. Right. Right. Amazing. And did you try yourself to map, for example, uh, the, um, according to different uh, regions of uh, startups, uh, where or uh, what amount? Only in the United States, uh, because I'm so familiar with the deals that come across my desk at the rate of two a day. And I'm uh, one of the early members, uh, but not the founder of the Tech Coast Angels, the largest angel group in the United States. And uh, with that, we see another two or three a day as well. So yeah, we see a lot of deals from a lot of areas of the country, most of them concentrated in just a few of uh, those states. So we have 50 states, I would say four of them account for most of the deals that we see. And those four are the ones with the most competition. Again, yes. therefore the minimum value would be higher. And have you ever invested in Europe or outside United States? Only in Canada. And it's all because of tax. And so I do have several funds that I manage. And one of the funds has foreign investors outside the United States. But uh, our government requires more reporting, withholding of taxes on profits, and lots of things that these investors don't necessarily like. And uh, I would have to check country by country in the opposite. If we make money from the sale of a company in uh, Germany, for example, our is the German government going to withhold any kinds of funds because of the location of the company? I haven't breached that need yet. So I'm glad to hear that it at least not because uh, there is less sexy startups in European market, but that's because of simple tax and legislation reasons. Realizing that I'm now offending your audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is true. Uh, and so you really have areas. Uh, think of Israel. Uh, Israel is as much of an innovation center as the United States, I would think. Uh, yet we've made no investments in Israeli companies unless they form a United States organization or subsidiary. I fully agree with you. There are plenty of amazing startups in Israel and also in Europe. Uh, the problem is that European corporate ventures, they are not so active. Uh, in uh, um, M&A and in uh, collaboration with startups uh, as they do it uh, in US. But uh, I hope that things will change soon. Me too. <laughs> Dave, it would uh, expand greatly our opportunities. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, Dave, can you please uh, tell me uh, a little bit, how long does it take you to use Berkus method to evaluate startup? Do you do it during the pitch you are listening? Or automatically already calculating or does it take you a few days? Actually, I do use it during the pitch. Uh, that's interesting to uh, hear. I hadn't had that question asked of me before. Uh, I do because there are so many that I see. Sometimes, many times, I uh, discard them out of hand, always responding, always making sure that I give some feedback. But if I'm going to go any further, I have already kind of used that method in my mind to decide not necessarily the valuation, but the, uh, the region of valuation. Good question. And do you do some additional investigation before taking final decision? I mean, you listen to the pitch, you have in your mind already uh, the Berkus method uh, results, and then uh, what you are doing? Lots of questions. So if I am interested enough to see that this is an idea that I like, the $500,000 first test, uh, I'll wait for the end of the presentation. Hopefully it's reasonably short. <laughs> if it's longer than 20 minutes or longer than 10 to 15 slides, uh, my eyes glaze over as most investors do. But after that point in time, uh, if I'm still interested, other than giving them a little quick feedback, 
I will begin asking questions that help me involve that set of four questions more deeply. And then do you do any kind of uh, financial due diligence, meaning not checking their accounts, but checking their business plan, business model, financial forecast, etc. Or you find it to be just uh, illusions, which uh, plan never uh, goes executed as it promised. Well, I have two answers for that. Uh, I manage a total of six funds, three of them for the Tech Coast Angels. Those three funds co-invest, which means somebody else, the members of the uh, angel group, have already gone through a deep dive with due diligence. And I have to believe that that report is what I'll base my final decision upon. But of those deals that I see directly, the answer is, yes, I will go through their deck, their uh, summary, and a series of questions, uh, not necessarily doing much more with their financial projections than seeing whether or not they believe they can become a large enough company, which I define as 20 million US dollars by the end of the fifth year, a run rate of 20 million, which gives them the sixth year in which to accomplish it. Uh, that question is pretty important to me because if I don't get a yes, and this looks like a company that can get to 4 million US dollars, I'm really not interested because the valuation can never get that high. Even for a SaaS company, for a cloud-based company, where the valuations are usually the highest. So those companies that are based upon ideas that are uh, cloud-based or software that is cloud-based, therefore more readily available, will generate between five and eight times uh, the average revenue run rate at the time of exit. And that's interesting to me, and many of my investments come because of that. I can give you examples. Would be Here great. It comes. There is a company that I invested in in the year 2002. It was the second company for a founder where we got a 6x return the first time. And uh, he went with the buyer of his company, uh, a public company, and two years later left that buyer and formed his own. And he wrote me and said, Dave, you were my board member CEO coach way back when, and I'm founding a new company. I'm going to create a sidecar LLC, which is an investment entity. And I'd like you to have 22%. I figured out how the rest of my friends get the rest of this, of this little sidecar. If you'll write me a $30, 30 US dollar check. Well, that's nothing. So I wrote him a $30 check. I put it in a manila folder and I forgot it. 14 years later, now you gotta let that sink in. I see in the trades that he sold his company for 600 million US dollars. And so I phoned him and said, Andre, Andre, remember me? <laughs> and he said, yes, laughing. Yes, Dave, I have this list on my desk. Do you wanna know how much your $30 is worth? $360,000 or 12,000 times the value of that $30 check. Now, that's not a lot of money. It is a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money compared to some other gains that I've made in the past. But it's the largest multiple I've ever had. <laughs> I ever heard about. Uh, I, I should confess, that's an amazing story. That kind of story should be uh, used in the books uh, and uh, then uh, create a, a different legends about unicorns. Uh, can you, you name bet. this company? Say again? Can you name this company? Uh, yes. I should be wearing the shirt. The company is called Ping Identity. It was the very first company for universal sign-in and identity management for employees of large corporations. And they are still available on the market? Very much. Oh, yeah. So uh, that was one example of many. I told you about the 7.6x. In 1999, I heard the pitch of a company that was trying to create a way in which uh, kids who didn't have credit cards could charge on the internet. Now we laugh at that today, but back then it was impossible to get onto Disney Interactive, which was a brand new site back then, and buy uh, things or join into uh, groups. And so this person had the idea of developing what turned out to be the world's first debit card. And so I invested uh, I think it was $75,000 in this idea. 
and at a $2 million valuation. Well, that company went public 11 years later. And uh, boy, I think my, my 75,000 was worth six and a half million or something of the kind. It was 110X by the time. Uh, and I sold a few shares on the way up. So uh, there's an example of hanging in there for what turns out to be 11 years, which by the way, is my average years to liquidity, longer than many of the other organizations like to claim. So the average people say is seven and a half years to liquidity. That means positive, not just write-offs. <laughs> and mine is longer. And I don't know why. I do know a little bit. When you make an angel investment and use the Berkus method or any method to make your investment at a one and a half million dollar valuation or two million or whatever, and then later on the company starts to show its success and attracts venture capital, universally the venture capitalists reset that clock by another seven years. So if I'm four years into a company that now has really begun to grow and they attract another five million or more dollars from venture capitalists, I'm looking at my 11 years. <laughs> so it's logical. 11 years and entrepreneurs usually promise that you will get your return of investments in maximum three years or five at least. So Yes, but never. Well, the one that I told you about, the 7.6x, is the rare exception. And I'll use the word rare again. So be aware of that. So I have other stories, many of them. But my favorite story, I've got to tell you now if you're willing to listen. With pleasure. I, I don't think there's anyone in the world that has not heard this story. So if you've heard it, stop me. But uh, in 1990, I was the founder and CEO of a computer company that uh, provided a core software, reservations and front office software for hotels. It was the largest hotel computing software company in the world. And in fact, in 1982, way back when, Marriott licensed it for a few of their new hotels that they called Courtyard. Today, they are still using that 38-year-old software for 2,200 of their hotels. I thought I'd throw that in there. So this person, his name was Tom, was my chief programmer in 1990. And he wanted to be a marketing person, not a programmer, or certainly not a program manager. And so he said in his regular meetings with me, I want to be a marketing person or I have to leave. And I said, you can't do that. You have 26 programmers of our 230 reporting to you. And we have thousands of hotels worldwide. It just makes no sense to me, Tom. But Tom left. And he sold his house, and I didn't hear from him again for five years. Five years later, August 26th, 1995, here's a copy of the letter. I have the original under glass, but this is a copy that I carry around with me. And I do carry it around with me because I use it often. And that's why many people have heard this story before. It starts. Hello again, Dave. Uh, after looking around rather a lot, I have ended up as employee number seven at a Seattle-based internet retail startup called Amazon.com. Tom was the head of marketing at Amazon, and he was in the group of first employees. <clears throat> it was, <clears throat> excuse me, it was two weeks into the first use of the Amazon site. And he said, I'm looking at my stock options and counting the days. You really ought to look at what we're doing. The founder is in round two of capital seeking. Now let me stop and say it was Jeff's mother who was round one. This was his first real round, okay? He was looking for increments of $100,000 and if I had the minimum, I would buy in. This from a cautious, a naturally dubious insider. I'm sure, I know, here it is. Uh, Jeff is in round two. Um, if you'd like, I would be happy to introduce you because I'm sure that Jeff would be willing to take your money. Now I had a twin engine airplane back at that time and I flew to Seattle, which is a thousand miles away from where I am to service some of the accounts. So it wasn't unusual for me to fly that far. I had the plane, but I still was investing principally in businesses that were nearby. 
one of my 10 rules. And so I wrote him back and I said, Tom, great to hear from you. Keep me informed. So two years later, Amazon went public very early in the stage. And I ask my audiences when I tell this story, come on, somebody guess how much that $100,000 would have been worth two years later. 100 million. No, a little high, but that's a great idea. It was 33 million. And then as you know, early stage investors are locked up for six months. They can't sell their shares even if they want to. And I uh, didn't look at six months, but one year after that point, 33 million had turned to 66 million. So I told that story at the Angel Capital Association's annual meeting when I was a keynote or a general speaker. And as I came off the stage about four years ago, two people surrounded me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, come over here, Dave. And they had their iPads open and they had been calculating the value of what that 33 million would have been worth if I'd held that stock to that date, which is about 2017. And the answer was $3.5 billion. Today, that would be $6 billion. <laughs> but nobody holds the stock. I mean, that's a, kind of a joke, even though it's obvious that Jeff is now the richest person in the world, <laughs> uh, worth hundreds of billions of dollars. This is the story of somebody who turned down the earliest opportunity. It is really heartbreaking. I understand that. Uh, I, I guess um, a lot of people in our community at least have uh, regretted that they did not buy, for example, Bitcoin when it was one centimo uh, or something like that. Uh, but they, when you miss these kind of opportunities that are coming to your table, I guess you really, really feel um, heartbreaking. Especially, yeah, when they become valuable enough to become unicorns, especially. But then, you know, the psychic benefit to me from that story, even though I never saw that kind of money, was that I can tell the story again and again and again. <laughs> so that's why there isn't a person in the world that hasn't heard it, especially now that they've listened to Nelly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And tell me, please, uh, Dave, did you use this Berkus method when you evaluated this Amazon opportunity? Because there is not written that uh, the company should be uh, in your region or in your area. I did not. Uh, that was 1990. I didn't invent the method till 1990. Well, excuse me. He came to me in 1995. I invented the method in 1996. Ah, so it was uh, one year later when you, you invented mm -hmm. the method. And if you have used it, then most probably you will not skip this opportunity, correct? <laughs> I think I had already looked at the Amazon site, but you've got to remember that back in those days, we were using Mozilla, and I'm not sure Netscape had come along yet. I mean, it was a very early time for the internet. I was still on AOL.com for my mail address, not Berkus.com. And uh, sure, looking in that environment, despite the fact that I knew Tom, I had invested more than 100,000 in a number of companies and I have great stories, but no, uh, that was just too far away. <laughs> Dave, I can imagine how difficult it is should be for you uh, to give uh, general advice, especially to Europe and you know, international startup audience, because indeed the ecosystem in California, in San Francisco is so different from all other ecosystems worldwide, uh, but uh, still, can you give some hints, for example, who should be making valuation at this first step? I mean, should it be the startup founding team uh, to evaluate their company and then come to investors to pitch with already ready valuation, or they should just pitch the opportunity and then wait for the evaluation and offer from investor side? Nelly, great question again. <laughs> it is, because if the founder comes to us and, say, and says something like, uh, my mother and my uh, uncle invested at a valuation of 10 million, <laughs> what do you say to the founder when you think the valuation should be 1.5 million? Often, when that has happened, we don't reset their expectations. We just say no. Uh, it is because of the difficulty of trying to rationalize 
the earliest investors, the friends and family and fools that have invested at valuations that the company has placed on their idea out of enthusiasm, that we don't want to get into that argument. So the answer is, it is best that they do not place a valuation on, not even a valuation expectation. Let us do that as part of the negotiation. So even if investor asks you, uh, what is your valuation? It is better to answer, uh, and what do you think? Or something like that. You can say, I've used the Berkus method, and I've used the Ohio Tech Angels method, and I've used the Bill Payne method, and I have an idea. Uh, but let's see what you come up with. That if you can't then, imagine, that's the nice way of answering. You can't imagine how valuable these or advice of yours is, uh, you can't imagine how many uh, times we talk with the founders who say, for example, yeah, I invested, um, I, I got uh, a cedar round or um, angel round from the friend on uh, 100K uh, with valuation of 10 million. So I guess right now I should be 20 million because it is already two years uh, later, uh, so, something like that. <laughs> and, exactly. And my sweat equity is worth something, and so that's part of the valuation. Absolutely, we, yes, yes. And it's very difficult to uh, argue with them uh, that uh, they should not say these kind of things to professional investors. And how about non-professional investors? Because again, you are angel and you are venture investor. But at the same time, even if you are angel, you have all the infrastructure at your disposal. Uh, your expertise, uh, your knowledge, uh, all your partners, yes. friends, and uh, other angels, uh, they cannot have this infrastructure simply because uh, uh, they don't have access or experience yet. Uh, what should they do? Well, first of all, if it's within the element of the Tech Coast Angels with 450 members, we will have an expert or two or 20. So that's the easiest way to begin. Uh, and I rely upon them when we find them and they step forward. Uh, otherwise, I have to do industry research, usually pointed by the company. Uh, and the biggest problem is finding competitors because the company doesn't want to name them the ones that are most viable. And I have to find them because many times this unique idea has been disproved, used, or sometimes even successfully used by others. So all of these are elements we have to uh, think of as rocks in the river. <laughs> There's no way that uh, we can not explore these, even if they're not a part of the presentation and not part of the founder's knowledge. <laughs> Dave, you mentioned also that you upgraded your uh, valuation method when? In 2000, uh, in 2000 yes? 16, ah, 2016. In 2016. How do you think after the coronavirus pandemic after in 2020, 21, will you need uh, to make one more amendment of the model? I won't amend it. I think that the investors will. The people who are using the method will. It will be lower. And we're finding those kinds of bargains now. And there are two reasons. One, early stage companies are beginning to run out of cash because they're not getting the investments that they thought they would get around this time. And that obviously becomes the reason for making a lesser priced or more bargain of uh, an offering. That's the biggest one. And the second one is, generally speaking, companies in retail and other environments that are uh, inhibited because of COVID are going to have to be cheaper because their expectations have to be lower. So you think that it will actually influence the whole uh, industry cycle and uh, the future valuation models for at least uh, the next maybe five or 10 years? No, I think for the next two years, maybe three. Ah, uh, and, then, and then we can expect the next boom or something like that. Yes. Uh -huh. I'm expecting a little bust coming up. And there's another story. You ready to hear another story? Do we have time? Absolutely. In 1999, uh, I found a company that uh, really wasn't a company at the time. It was people who were designing websites. At five o'clock, that little company of uh, eight people would stop their work and begin playing internet games, first person shooter games, using a piece of lobby software that they had licensed from somebody else. And they had a million people coming into this lobby with them, a million people that they controlled on their server. 
and yet they never charged. It was a game. They were having a great time. And when I first saw that, my eyes just exploded, bugged out is the term. And so I offered to invest in this non-entity and I helped them to create a company out of nothing. And uh, we incorporated the company for a million dollars. That was the valuation that I gave it back in 1999. Uh, and I gave 90% to the founder for the idea and the fact that he had all of these eyeballs. And I took 10% for $100,000 that I invested. And then I loaned another 150,000 to them for working capital. It was three months later that we attracted from a, a fairly uh, well-known investor, $3 million at a valuation, not of 1 million, but of 30 million, three months. Three months after that, we attracted another 3 million from a very large corporation at a valuation of $60 million. Two months later, uh, we got a valuation of 80 million for another million five in an investment. You're getting the idea. So it's now 14 months after we founded this little company, we had 20 million people coming to the site, no real revenue, a little advertising revenue, but no real revenue. And CNET offered us 140 million for 49% of the company, meaning 280 million. 1999, $2,000. So today that would be the same as about 700 million US dollar valuation in one year and two months. And so we took it. Then the crash of 2000, two months later, while we were in the middle of organizing this sale, and the buyer stock went down to nothing. CNET stock went down to near nothing. And so they didn't complete the deal. We couldn't complete the deal. And we went back to business. And it was four and a half or five years later that we sold the company for 65 million, a lot less than the valuation we might have gotten, but a very big number and one we're very happy with. And so uh, it's a lesson that these booms will increase the valuation dramatically and the bus do the same in the opposite direction. And there's a great example. Yes, there is a great example. And also a great example of the fact that uh, the team, neither team, neither you gave up, uh, continued developing the business and then uh, succeeded, maybe less scale, but still. And that's amazing. And by the way, my question is here on this example, in three months, such a huge increase of valuation. Can it be because you joined with your reputation, authority, and network? And uh, can it be uh, because of that, or there were other reasons? I can't take credit for that. It was the <laughs> it was the run up, the excitement to uh, the year two thousand that you just had to be there. Everybody wanted to throw money at these companies that looked like they were getting bigger and had eyeballs, lots of people that were there. By the time we had that first three month, in, month investment, the 1 million valuation or the 1 million viewers was probably at wild guess 2 million. It was growing very fast. I remember it got up to 20 million by the time that uh, we got that heavy valuation 14 months later. So with that kind of growth, people are willing to put money in just as they are today with unicorns at valuations that are so high you know, 65 to 110 times revenue, it's not sustainable. And that's when you know you need to get out. <laughs> Dave, your stories are amazing, especially you have also this very charming uh, voice. And uh, when I found your YouTube channel while preparing for the interview, I could not stop listening to the videos. I love these short formats with the uh, short pieces of advice of uh, up to 10 minutes uh, for each case. That's amazing. Guys who are watching us right now, uh, in the description, we will put the links uh, to Dave Berkus, uh two YouTube channels. Uh, why uh, one, uh, I guess, personal and another one for a kind of uh, marketing sites. They are amazing. Highly recommended to watch them on and subscribe. Uh, nice. Thank you, Nelly. Just keep talking. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. And Dave, uh, speaking about this example, uh, many people say that when the market is down, an investor should invest. So are you right now actively investing in startups? Okay. So I have to give you the answer that is true today. I am just approaching 80 years old, almost 80. When I say it's 11 years to liquidity, that's 91. 
So I stopped investing two years ago. The only investing I'm doing is in the funds that I manage because I can always take the management of those funds and I have backup managers and hand the management of those funds to somebody else. This classification is more profitable than almost any other kind of investing that you can make. But to do so, you have to have, as we've looked and been advised for so many years, at least 25 investments. Well, I have 202. So I'm way beyond the guaranteed break-even number. And you probably read in places that my internal rate of return going back to 1993, going back to 1981, when I started the computer company, is 101% per year. That's like doubling a penny every year, okay? Uh, so that's a false indication, by the way, and I have to tell your viewers, listeners, that uh, an IRR, internal rate of return, starts the day you make the investment and stops the day that you receive the money from that investment. That's important to know because I would hand that money to my bank who would then manage the money until I began to invest again, say at 25 to $50,000 increments, not the 6 million that I just handed them. And so that number is artificial. If you try and then add all of the gains, including those that the bank generated, that 101 goes down to 23% per year. That's still a great number. But if you isolate the number that the bank has generated for its part over all these years, it's only 5% per year. So if we expect to see 5 to 7% per year, if we're investing in regular stocks in the stock market, we should expect to see 9 to 23%. That's a big range, but 9 to 23% for angel investing. But you've got to have at least 25 investments. Many angels hear this and rush in the first year to put all of their money on the line. Wrong. So it takes years to be able to get the portfolio that you think is right. Let the ones that are going to be lost lose and then write them off. And it is those winners that you ride for, in my case, 11, and in many other cases, people say seven years, that make all that money. And 23% is what we'd like to say is the average return over a long period of time for angels that have spent a long period of time making those investments. Does that help? Oh, yes, that helps a lot. And actually, that is amazing that you can uh, truly say uh, how to calculate the proper numbers, because indeed, a lot of uh, so-called um, uh, basic criteria like IRR, etc., uh, they uh, they sound very uh, solid and reasonable, but uh, when you dig into it, you understand that they don't mean so much. Think of the teeth of a saw with a long period before the saw gets the next tooth. That's a good way of looking at it. So the IRR only measures those peaks, not the full amount of time. Uh, Dave, and you mentioned that you stopped investing, um, or oh, maybe paused, I, go, I, I hope, uh, two years ago, because um, uh, you uh, don't want to wait until uh, return in 11 years. You want to relax this time. Uh, but do you have some kind of um, dynasty, your protege, uh, whom you educated how to make investments like you did? I would say that that is true within the Tech Coast Angels. We have an investment committee of five that I have uh, helped to manage for, boy, 10 years. And I have two members who uh, have taken over, or at least are ready to take over, the funds from me. So yes, I have that kind of protection, and I have that kind of training that I continue to make. So the answer is yes. Dave, uh, did you ever see the startup who, for example, requires valuation? or due diligence reports from um, consulting companies, sometimes even from big four, and then comes to an investor with already prepared solid document proving that uh, the valuation is uh, 100 million, whatever, uh, and uh, startup paid for it, uh, you know, that maybe 20K, maybe 50K just for this paper. Have you met these kind of cases? Yes, and I have never invested in one of those companies because I won't argue with the founder. Yes, I've had that happen. Now, I offer a uh, very inexpensive way of using the Verkus method. 
uh, and I haven't done this often, but I have a medallion that I allow the company to put onto their website and their documents uh, after I have done an evaluation using my own method of their company. And I charge a small amount of money, $500 for doing that. But uh, that's a little different than going to one of the big four and letting them use the financial method of uh, going through, <clears throat> excuse me, the discounted cash flow and figuring out what this company is worth today based upon their own projections of $45 million of revenue at the end of the fifth year, which I never believed. So solid stamp of uh, the big uh, consulting company will not uh, influence investors' decision, especially at the early stage. It's just the opposite. Then it's like somebody preparing a, uh, a private placement memo, a PPM. Uh, they spend lots of money with their attorney. They put this PPM together and we refuse to look at it because that means that they have gone through all of this process to, to uh, attempt to show a higher valuation, even if they don't name the valuation. And it becomes difficult for us to begin a conversation. Uh, Dave, uh, you also have uh, these uh, amazing uh, lessons for startup founders about different aspects of the development. Like I really enjoyed the, the topic of whether you waste money and time on the patent or another topic where you uh, discuss uh, if lawyers can ruin the deal. Right. That's really amazing. You present real use cases, which we see every day in the life, but you name things with their own words without any hesitation or um, uh, the diplomacy or whatever. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask, uh, is it, Will it form some kind of course by Dave Berkus, or it will be in your new book? That's a good question, too. Uh, I do teach remotely several courses. Um, there is one in, uh, I believe it's in Belgium, that I teach on board uh, creation and board usage for uh, companies of all sizes. Uh, and that one has been restricted to CEOs who buy into that particular graduate school. I'm about to do it again for uh, the World Business uh, Forum, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'll have a series of courses then as well. So there is a kind of an answer just beginning to be developed right now. Uh, the best way to do all this is to buy those YouTube videos or buy the books. So each book tells 101 different stories. That's the number that I pick per book because the stories are short. And as you know, the lessons are uh, better if read quickly. <laughs> so people's attention span, I know to be rather short. And so I use 300 to 600 words in each of these uh, stories. Uh, you'll find the same stories in my blogs, the blogs Birkonomics, uh, which you might also relate to as well, are distributed to over 200,000 people a week. And uh, those blogs, again, are short stories often coming from the book, or they become part of the book later on, another book. So yeah, I love to tell stories. I've seen over 10,000 companies, and I've told you I've invested in 202 of them. So there are lots of stories. I can imagine. And how can entrepreneurs get access to these online courses you told about? I guess in Belgium is for some specific company or uh, uh, pool of companies. Uh, but will you have some kind of online uh, course for everyone who wants to apply? Not yet. Uh, it was the World Business Angel Forum, uh, which is run by a person in Turkey and uh, uses many of the angels in Europe as uh, examples. And uh, they reached out to me and asked if I'd like to teach a course. And I think I said, I gave them three different courses I would teach. Valuation uh, at the early stage, uh, board membership, and uh, I don't remember, something else on entrepreneurism. And so they're just developing the courses now and I gave them my course outlines. So you're very early with that question and it may be generally available. And uh, are you actually planning uh, to collaborate with other angel? Net if I understand correctly, in uh, uh, Tech Coast Angels, uh, you are having a seat on the board as well, not, not just a member, but also uh, a board member uh, of the organization. Uh, do you plan to uh, develop cross-border or even cross-continent collaborations with angel networks from Europe? I have to say cross-continent 
I have to be careful about that because again, we have the fear of not having enough knowledge country by country of what the tax requirements are. Otherwise, this would be a much easier question to answer. But yes, uh, we syndicate deals often with angel groups anywhere in the United States. I've made investments in Canada, uh, but that's pretty close. And so that's pretty easy for me. And I would think the answer is generally no, and that's because of lack of knowledge. Knowledge of local legislation and taxation system. Mm -hmm. And if your local partners will provide you with all the necessary information about uh, their regional inf uh, information. Nobody ever has, but it certainly would be the way to do it. <laughs> yes. Uh, Dave, one more question, which is actual for many startup teams. Uh, are you acting as an advisor in the startups where you may be not invested in, but your knowledge will really, really help them in their development? Well, I do consult on occasion, yes. And you would go to the website, berkus.com, to get that information. Uh, and okay. I do charge by the hour for that. And occasionally people buy an hour or two or three, mm -hmm. sometimes and, more. And do you sometimes have uh, commitments uh, not uh, charged by an hour, but for example, for equity? I have a total of nine boards that I sit on, not for dollars, but for equity. And the equity is very small. It's a percent to a percent and a half. And I'm an advisor to 17 companies at this point where I'm on their quote advisory board. And I help them to establish the advisory board if I'm not, you know, if I'm the first member of it. And that uh, usually is a quarter to a half a percent of the equity of the company. Oh yeah, that's, uh, that's really a lot of commitment from your side. Uh, and I can't imagine where you find so many time to participate and get involved in each of them. So definitely uh, consulting uh, basis is uh, much more reasonable and executable. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, uh, before the end of our interview, can you please uh, give um, some uh, personal advice uh, to startup founders who are preparing for the fundraising round and who are using uh, Berkus method for their valuation on uh, how to get uh, better prepared uh, for negotiation with investors? One super important advice you already gave them. Uh, don't put estimated valuation in your pitch deck and don't even name it before uh, I investor asks, uh, but what about other important aspects uh, which you feel are uh, among pain points? Um, I would like a company to develop a mantra. A mantra is three words to a sentence, very, very short, that describes the company in a way in which I can understand it right away in the context of whatever I really know. So for example, uh, a great mantra for uh, um, a shoe company, I'm making this up, might be, we are the Nike of invent the environment that the shoe is in, uh, of environments. And so I know right away what they're trying to believe that they are. Or uh, take a bicycle delivery service, not that I would invest in a bicycle delivery service, but uh, they might say we're the FedEx of bicycle deliveries, meaning always on time, and uh, guaranteed service and on and on. But it just gave me with five words in that case, all I need to know before I read or hear anything, a mantra. So that's the beginning. The second is I don't care about a mission statement and I'll never really want to read a mission statement, but I do want to hear their goals and maybe even the strategies, how they're going to get to where they want to be. So the goal is $20 million run rate at the end of five years. That's a good one because that's where it triggers my real interest. And here's how I'm going to get there. One, two, three, four, five. I don't need to hear the tactics. I just need to hear how you're going to do this. Uh, and that begins to tell me the competition, how you're going to develop the product, how you're going to market the product, and whether or not you believe you need help from outside people. So those are things that you can bake into the original PowerPoint presentation. And you can bake into the executive summary, which is just a few more words, a page or two, telling me more than the few words that you used in the PowerPoint. And that's the second thing. That's the second piece of advice. Fewer words, greater effect. <laughs> Don't use a lot of words. It just makes it easier for us all, including yourself. 
You mean in written DAC or uh, also in oral pitch? Um, if you have a long run on sentence, you've lost me already. So precise. My son, when he was young, invented the word concision, which is a non word, concise and precision. And it is a, a perfect description of what I'd like to see. Someone telling me without a lot of words, something that I can absorb and remember. That's why the mantra is also why a short deck. Those are two pieces of a good advice. Amazing. So first of all, the mantra will show you the face of the startup or the soul of the startup in uh, just a few words, uh, explaining all their sense. Uh, right. And uh, second, uh, be laconic, which means don't waste time of investors. Uh, go into uh, uh, into the ground uh, and uh, just uh, provide the details uh, instead of uh, words. Well stated. That's it. Mm -hmm. Dave, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And guys who are watching us right now, first of all, read in the description. You will find all the links to Dave's uh, website, Ama uh, links on uh, his uh, Amazon book, which I also highly recommend it to read it to every entrepreneur uh, who wants uh, to avoid a mistake and uh, to learn on success of others. Second, uh, we will also add here uh, the description of uh, Dave's uh, Berkus method one more time. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, referring uh, to the website where it is uh, described very properly with all the details. And third, I suggest you uh, ask in the comments uh, questions which you would like to ask to Dave Berkus and uh, suggest your ideas if in 2021 after the pandemic and in the new digital world uh, we will need uh, to adapt uh, Berkus method one more time what will you advise or what is your idea how it should be adapted to be really universal uh, for the new age and uh, if there will be really great suggestions from your side we will forward them to Dave and uh, he will review them and uh, give the feedback and maybe even cherry pick one of them uh, to uh, recommend uh, for uh, entrepreneurs in future. Who knows? Dave, thank you very much for being with us today. That's amazing. And I hope that uh, in uh, some time uh, we can meet again online and go through the questions of the founders and uh, check uh, their suggestions of your method improvement. Thank you. You are amazing. Great luck for you. Nelly, thank you very much. You asked great questions. Thank you again.